lecture is Professor Carlos Cruz from Munich University. Uh, so the title of the talk is here. Yeah. Should I switch to the one? It might be better because um, some of the pictures are not visible. Yeah. So I switch to it? Yes, yes. Okay. First of all, I would like to introduce myself. Um, uh, okay, I don't speak Russian. <laughs> I apologize for this. Um, I am from the University of Munich, and my background is engineering, so I'm not really a physicist, but I'm an engineer. And um, my um, uh, field of interest is um, computing and code writing. And uh, today I uh, uh, would like to introduce you to a, a, a topic that has come up uh, recently um, in the context of very strong um, laser fields. And so I would like to introduce you um, to a, a numerical method which is called particle and cell. The particle and cell method is well known, I guess. Um, and um, but here um, I um, extend it to um, the process of cascading, which means the production of um, electrons, positrons, and uh, photons uh, from um, extreme or very intense external fields. So um, here's a brief outline of what I would like to cover. Um, after that simulation, um, Sections. It might be good to have a little break, which would be about 45 minutes, and then uh, in the second part I will um, focus more on how I really do the things in the computer. So uh, um, I give a few references, um, then I will talk a little bit about non equilibrium in many particle systems. Uh, cascading is uh, many patterns, many uh, body problems, and uh, so we need to know. Uh, a little bit about that. Uh, then a cascading has something to do with radiation. And so we'll talk about the equation in that context, which is the Lorentz after Dirac equation. I do not really need it later on, but it's a classical equation and it's easy um, to um, derive and uh, it's also easy to uh, immerse into this many particle and uh, many body context. And so I explain it. Then I will show you a few simulations, so the pictures. Um, the simulations I've done I can uh, obtain from a little laptop, so if you have a pocket calculator and a laptop, you can do all I'll show you. Yeah, so it's not really a huge supercomputing. Uh, then I will uh, talk about the quasi-element method. The quasi-element method is a numerical method uh, that can be used to represent um, so-called probability density. That is, uh, probability density is something we need to describe many particles. Um, then I, um, I do this first on a more general level, and then I um, will um, uh, apply it to uh, cascading um, equations. We are used for cascading are a little bit more um, complicated than classic equations, but less complicated than Boltzmann equations. And then I have to talk a little bit about multi scales. So the computer is finite, and uh, if uh, during uh, simulations uh, uh, we run into the problem of uh, uh, generating uh, multiple scales, short scales, and then that might make source uh, our resources, and uh, simulations might become uh, possible. And then I, there are also many things I do not uh, cover, and I just mentioned them at the end. So here's um, the literature um, I have made use of. Um, there is a book by the court. This is a relativistic genetic theory uh, principles and applications from uh, the 1980s, it's very old. Um, then there is a book about the particle and cell method by Gregoriev, uh, Bishkov, and Peterok. Um, this might uh, be known here in this audience. <coughs> then there is an original science paper by Bishkov. Uh, 
Vitos in the 1960s. Um, that one I've used to reference uh, cross sections. So, um, now what, what is the general theoretical framework um, we need um, as a kind of a, um, as, a, as a background for the um, computational um, approach? So, if you have non equilibrium uh, many particle systems, um, we normally introduce a so called n particle probability. And this entity simply tells us um, how big um, the likelihood is to find a particle one at a certain position in phase space and at the same time another particle at another position and then the nth particle at position x and p and at a given time t. And um, this um, is the density and now this entity here, so if we multiply by volume in the configuration space and the momentum space, that will then be the probability of finding a particle um, um, one between x1 and x1 plus dx1 and so on up to particle n between xn and xn plus dn to dxn and the same for the momenta. And then we apply a minimization condition. That means if we you know, integrate over the whole configuration into the momentum space and the whole phase space, then we have um, n particles. And um, the uh, total number um, um, in our um, phase space um, is conserved for the moment. This will not apply later on for cascading, but, uh, but here I assume for simplicity that it's conserved. And in that case, uh, this implies that I have um, uh, this equation for here. It means that the total time derivative of our value with respect to t has to be Now, um, what kind of um, equation of motion does um, this probability density follow? I mean, you know, all this, this is the Liouville -Li equation ultimately. And uh, how do you, would uh, one derive it? Well, one uh, starts from a, a probability density of that kind, that's equation 5. So, this is the probability of finding a particle at uh, k at x k and uh, p k. And then we um, multiply all, all particles on to n. And um, the xk um, and the pk's are um, time dependent functions. They are the trajectories of the particles. And then we can use equation 5 to obtain the equation of motion for these quantities. Quantity C. And so that is what we do here. So we derive C with respect to time. As that becomes then those right hand sides here. Um, a, a derivative of delta distributions is implied, and that's in the sense of distributions. Um, I don't want to detail it further. Um, and uh, then we make use of um, uh, this relation 7 down here. And uh, we ultimately come up with equation 9. Uh, equation 9 is then the new equation um, for the probability uh, density C. And uh, that is not a very smooth function yet. And in order to make it smooth, uh, to make it smooth on the good average of all, let's say, initial conditions that are compatible with um, any possible observation. So there is a measurement we can do uh, on the system. And then we can define so-called observables that correspond to the measurements we do. And uh, observables can be calculated as part of C. And so all initial configurations that uh, have the same observable, the same values, so to say, they, they, are, they cannot be discriminated or distinguished, <coughs> and so we tend to more to get an average of them. And that gives them, um, in simple words, a smooth density function of the program. And that, that is then the uh, Liouville equations of the place C by winding up the Liouville equation. <laughs> now, um, n particle probability densities um, are very complicated, difficult. This means we I mean, have high order correlations, we have all correlations in the system, and there's nobody um, on this planet able to solve this. And so, one trick is 
to work with reduced uh, probability densities. Um, that also works in the quantum context. Yeah, so I just uh, apply the, the classical uh, description here for simplicity. Um, so a reduced probability density is one that tells me what probability of finding particle one at a certain position in phase space, why, why at the same time I cannot <coughs> care what all the other particles do. Yeah. But that means I integrate over more degrees of freedom other than the one with particle one. The two particle probability density, that's also a reduced probability density function. That is one that shows correlations between two particles. Uh, for instance, that will become relevant for radiation processes later. Or it might also be relevant for yeah, in general yeah, for radiation collision processes. Uh, a two particle probability density function tells us how likely is it to find particle one at position one phase space and particle two at position two, while we do not care about all the others, three and so on. Particles are indistinguishable. So here um, I um, try to define a reduced probability density, and there's one thing we have to obey. Um, we can only um, apply such a concept of reducing probability functions uh, to low degrees of freedom if we have um, interactions that have only a finite range. Uh, if the interaction is infinite, the range of the interaction is infinite, um, there are always a higher order correlation and we cannot really hope to um, survive with reduced density functions. For instance, if you look into um, astrophysics, physics, you know, planets, stars, dust, whatever, and you ask, can you apply some, something like statistical physics to this? You would say no, because they cluster, yeah, and there is no such thing as, as, a, as a simple loop. Yeah. Um, however, if we have hard spheres, then the interaction range is indeed finite, you know, just the sphere radius, and in that case it's straightforward to come up with a uh, hierarchy now of equations um, for reduced probability density functions. Okay, I have to tell this a little bit to tell you this because um, this is the, uh, the foundation of the computer code that I Okay, so um, now without going into details, if you work it through, then that's the equation, um, those are the equations of motion for um, S particle density. So this S tells us we have only S degrees of freedom. And so S can run from uh, 1 to N. And in the case of 1, it's the one particle probability density. And that will then cover to the two particle, uh, cover to the two particle probability density. And then the two particle to the three particle, and so on. And we call this the DB, G, and Y particle. I think it's all Russians in there. <laughs> Uh, and, um, and here is the, uh, for the Hubble sphere case, the definition of the reduced probability densities. You see, uh, we do a partial integration of the phase space, so from S plus 1 up to N. And then this is a, a step function um, that simply uh, restricts the integration to the desired uh, part of phase space. And that's the end of the distribution function. Okay? <coughs> Now, let us change the topic a bit now. So we now know there are probability densities, there are equations of motion for probability densities. The lower the uh, order of the probability density function is, most likely the more simple the situation becomes. The simplest case is a situation where you have no company to high order probability densities. So we only go with this, and that is, the, that is called the Flasov equation. Yeah, so that would be the Flasov equation. This Flasov equation has no force term um, uh, by external uh, forces, fields, uh, because uh, uh, I have only hard spheres, they have no charges, so they can only interact if they get into touch with each other. That's why there is no acceleration um, or term or so um, in this line up here. Uh, okay, now um, I come to the Lorentz of equations. And why don't we then? Well, we want to 
talk how we want to deal with charged particles. And also electrons and positrons are charged particles. Though they can weigh in cases they can interact with photons. They can absorb and emit photons. And uh, so um, the first question, question that arises is how would that interaction work in a, in a simple context? I mean, it's, uh, in, the case, in the case that we have only one particle, and that particle is that's a subject to an external field, and that particle can at the same time radiate or can, can also absorb radiation. What would the equation of motion be really? So that's the question now. Okay, and then I try to uh, marry this with the uh, many particle concept I've introduced you to just a few minutes ago. Now, Lorenz Abraham Dirac is essentially um, a, a solution for this uh, set of equations 19 and 20. Yeah, they are not, not complete, but I've just written the most essential ones here. So, first of all, one says um, that we have a point particle. So, that's an assumption. The particle is a point particle. And it's, um, it follows the Lorentz force. So, that would be this equation. That's a hypothesis. Yes. Okay, the Lorentz force holds for the charge particle. So it means that we have electromagnetic fields, and that's how the body would um, accelerate. Yeah. And then, um, as it uh, moves, um, it generates a current. We have to say what the current is like, um, but uh, the current causes uh, maximum separations. And uh, so um, the current um, produces fields. Uh, so it, the body radiates or absorbs radiation. And uh, then, um, since the particle is a point particle, we have to make an assumption of what um, the current looks like. And so we say the particle is along a road line, x of t, so it's along a road line, and has a velocity u of um, t or tau, which is the other line here. And um, so that um, expression 20 is then um, a um, hypothesis or um, representation of the current for the, for the point particle. And now we solve the equations 19 and 20. That means uh, from J, we first um, try to obtain A. Yeah. And so um, um, this is uh, what you find in textbooks uh, um, for A, if J is given. And then if you have A, you can uh, determine the uh, tensor F, the field strength tensor, so that's simply deriving it with respect to, to x, so the four vector x. <coughs> and that would then be um, expression 22, that's all very simple so far. Yeah, and then uh, we um, have to tell what this Green's function, this Green's function G is, genius, and uh, so G plus would be this expression here. So we have a step function. Um, so uh, that is one if um, the zero component of this quantity here is larger than zero, that would be t larger than t prime at all, <coughs> and times delta of s is squared. Okay. And so we take this g and plug it in this equation 22, and uh, do a little bit of manipulations, and uh, then we arrive at uh, equation 24. And what we have to do next is we have to deal with those quantities x minus uh, x prime, u prime, and so on. And uh, that uh, I do here, so we can develop x minus x prime uh, in terms of alpha, which is t minus tau. And we can do the same, we can do Taylor expansion around the work lines of the particle that is, you know, we expand around the work line into space and uh, so that, that gives equations 25 and then we make use of them and plug it all in but the details are not so important here I just wanted to put it on the screen and if you all uh, work if you all, if you work all things together then we end up with equation uh, 28 um, and uh, there is then now a, a mass and r that had to be uh, remobilized, um, and uh, so that equation 28 is the so-called Lorentz Hartmann equation. Okay, now the, the, this mass parameter m 
um, and R is, is taken to be the natural mass. Okay? But if you don't care um, about this infinity here, uh, I simply take it as a removalized mass to the natural mass. So essentially, the mass is probably only a, a dynamic parameter. There's no, no bare mass at all that I cannot decide. So, so I have this uh, natural mass here. And here we have um, the uh, field of all other particles. So to say, so that means if we have n particles surrounding our particle we're looking at, they all would radiate it, and they would all contribute radiation at the position of our particle uh, i. And on top, um, that specific particle we are looking at can radiate. So that's the self-radiation, the self-action. And that is this poster here. And you see there is a second derivative um, in time of the velocity. So that's the acceleration of the acceleration. And because of that term, um, this LAV equation is um, sort of um, controversial or complicated, I would say. So if you look into the literature, um, the discussion goes like this, that uh, you could say there is pre-acceleration, and uh, so the particle accelerates already before any signal or any action has arrived. So there is no radiation field, but particle accelerates and uh, there are many other problems. But I um, solved this on the computer and I must say it's not uh, problematic. Um, it can be that the, the algorithm is not accurate enough, uh, but it can also be that the situation is maybe more like this. Since this uh, equation 28 is a, a solution of equations 19 and 20, uh, a physic, uh, physically useful setup does not only imply that I say the particle starts and which velocity it has, I also have always to say what the field context is and the particle is immersed into. And that information is obviously in here. And so um, if on a computer I sort of calculate an approximate consistent solution, let's say by another equation in that context, London Lipschitz, and then I continue with LAD, I have no problem. Okay. <laughs> now, um, how does this equation go together with um, a many-body system of radiating particles? Well, the assumption now is following. We have I particles, I 1 to N, and their equations of motion are those up here. Again, the acceleration of the ice particle is due to the impact of all other particles around the ice particle. And um, the self force due to radiation absorption um, of the ice particle. Okay? This term here, this blue term, is the same um, as uh, this one here. It's only written in a somewhat uh, different fashion. And uh, this equation is only a, also a typical uh, time scale. Yeah, this is a comp time scale, I guess. Something that uh, not uh, well, But this, uh, this uh, tau zero is a very small number. And um, now we use equation 30 uh, to derive a, a transport equation. Yeah. So we now look for an equation motion for probability densities for those fine radiated particles. And that's the equation one obtains. Um, okay, that can be derived. Um, there is also uh, a lot of uh, literature in, in, uh, in mathematical physics about this. Uh, it's not really difficult. Um, let me try to explain what it means. Um, so you see, if that red term and that blue term here uh, would be a way you would have a flask equation again yeah, with a tuistic notation. So that would, all, that would represent as a free streaming gas. Yeah, so you have a gas at a certain temperature, at a time of zero, and you let it go. Um, and there is no force, no external force, no gravitation, no charge, um, no electric force, nothing. And the uh, system will follow that equation. And uh, now, um, you make it a little bit more complicated. You put the self force on top, and that's the self force. So there is a derivative, 
this with respect to momentum um, and times the star norm showing up on the right hand side of the equation. So this term essentially means that the volume of phase space yeah, that is uh, without any action conserved is now not con conserved anymore, so it can uh, it can become uh, so if R represents uh, charged particles, then it, it can it can uh, become large or smaller depending on, on the action of the term here. But if there's radiation absorption by the system, we blow it up. If there's radiation emission, the system cools down and phase space will shrink. But then on top, there's also a collision term, so to say. And this is uh, now this red term, the couples, uh, that has a, a, two, uh, a second order correlation function. You see this is, uh, ends up in, in, in a hierarchy again, because now you have to write down the interaction for R2, and then one for R3, and so on, and so on. And uh, this term here simply says, OK, um, on top of the cell force, the particle is also subject to um, the radiation impact by its neighbors. So you need uh, naturally a second order correlation function because you need at least one other partner. And uh, here's a Green's function, and so that is uh, that is uh, that describes the radiation of, um, of surrounding particles um, at the position of our particle and configuration. So that is um, an equation um, that is describing um, n radiating. Okay, so now um, let me continue. Now I come to the equations that are actually in the computer. Um, so um, equation 35 is very similar to equation 32. Um, in equation 35, this left-hand part of it, um, you know, there we have replaced the red part here by a mean field force, by the Lorentz force. The E and B fields are now calculated um, uh, from mean currents and charges. Yeah. So uh, that means they've been obtained from currents and charges that have undergone some averaging process. So that is typically um, a uh, velocity average over distribution that gives the current. Uh, and, um, so that's one, one um, great simplification. And the other one is that uh, the self force term, the blue term, is now replaced. Oh, sorry, I get, I get lost. <coughs> uh, it's now replaced by two contributions. So one term, one this term here minus this term. And uh, this is the radiation absorption and, and, and emission. And if one does a Taylor expansion uh, for, let's say, small case of photon emission, then uh, we can recover the leading terms of the LAP equation buried in this blue term. Yeah? So the, uh, the structure of this upper part of, of equation 32 is pretty much the same as that of equation 13, uh, 35 uh, as that of 32. Now, uh, uh, the cascading process is not only about radiation of charged particles, it's also about the production of new charged particles, and uh, from them, new radiation. And in order to uh, cover this, we have to uh, amend this equation 35 by another term. And that's a contribution from their uh, production. So, in simple words, um, what you see here means that the rate of change of electron and Positrons of relative densities is subject to radiation emission and absorption, subject to um, infection, and also subject to uh, the generation of new um, electrons and positrons. Now, um, to complete that equation, you see um, there is um, um, now a photon distribution function. Yeah. The function of photons, and uh, that one is a dynamical uh, entity, and so there must be an equation of motion for that one as well. And uh, that's equation 36. So here's the rate of change of uh, the photon distribution in our system uh, that uh, is subject to photons propagating away from a certain uh, 
airspace volume, but also uh, subject to radiation uh, uh, production by electrons and uh, positrons. <coughs> and uh, uh, it is uh, diminished by the amount of air production because um, the uh, air production process is such that it always requires a photon, a half photon, uh, to, and, and a strong external field uh, to take place. Now, okay, that's my um, uh, simple motivation for equation 35 and 36. You may ask, can that be derived from quantum electrodynamics on the fundamental level? Probably yes. To my knowledge, there is no such derivation uh, for the complete hierarchy yet. It's a very complicated problem. It might be possible uh, to um, at least obtain this upper part here. Um, more fundamentally, but uh, the question then is what does this really mean? We would probably have to apply h bar to zero approximations or so, otherwise, um, the uh, higher correlations might be not too strong. Um, uh, okay, <coughs> so I at least do not know from what a very fundamental relation um, in the quantum context. Um, Equation 35 and 36 are the ones I use in the computer code. And now the question is, how would we solve them numerically? Okay, um, before I come to this, I need to tell you what um, approximations I make for the radiation and the production cross sections or rays that show up. Equation 35 and 36. Um, they are um, based on a paper by uh, Litus and uh, Bayer from the 1960s. Um, I've given you the reference in the uh, literature section. And uh, those are quite simple formulas. Um, they hold um, uh, for um, ultra high fields under the assumption that constant crossed fields are okay for the processes. And uh, that is uh, for um, high density intensity is typically true. And so we get a simple analytic expression. And that's shown here. And uh, that will later be used uh, for the event generation process in the code. Um, this uh, radiation uh, transition rate depends on a few flow parameters. Um, this is around the x, down here in the integration, uh, at the integral. And x is a combination of uh, two so called uh, quantum uh, efficiency or Litus parameters, um, phi gamma and phi e. Uh, where here for the radiation emission, this uh, chi uh, gamma ranges from zero to chi e, which is about the uh, electron energy, um, positron energy um, of the electron and positron that radiates. And um, uh, then the, the, the explicit uh, form of chi e, chi gamma, is given by this. So they, they depend on classical fields um, e and h, or e and e, and the Phase space of the charged particles uh, exclusively. And so, what uh, uh, one has to do is one first of all has to say what the E and B fields in a particular uh, location in my uh, simulation box uh, would be. And then uh, I, have to, um, I have to know what the momentum of a particular particle is, the charged particle, and then I can calculate by E and by gamma. And I obtain x, and then I obtain the rate, and then with the help of the rate, I can fix um, those uh, source terms in uh, equation 35 and 36. So very simple. <coughs> and uh, for pair production, the situation is analogous. Then all the assignments changed here and here. Now the, uh, the, the shape of that function over Photo energy now uh, looks a bit different from the one for radiation uh, emission here in the context of strong fields, but it's again the same procedure. On the computer, you have to fix this by gamma, by E, then you obtain the rate, from the rate, you obtain the uh, 
first terms and so on. And uh, then the cycle process, okay? So that means uh, the computer typically, um, in some way or the other, will push particles. From the particles obtain currents, from the currents obtain fields, from the fields obtain the uh, elementary processes, the rates, from them to source terms that uh, determine some equations that look, and uh, then the equations are updated, the transport equations are updated, and that gives new currents and so on, and the cycle starts new. So now, uh, here's the first picture um, of cascading. So this um, picture has been uh, produced by the example of the dot off. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it shows uh, quite, quite uh, uh, illustratively how um, um, uh, cascading uh, is uh, supposed to be. So there is a uh, laser um, focus um, indicated by color shades in the background, high intensity in the center, low intensity in the periphery. And then there is some uh, initial um, particle gets uh, gets in the background. So uh, since we are dealing with electrons, positrons, and photons, and essentially QED, uh, the C particle could also be a positron, it could be a photon, it doesn't matter. And uh, from there on, um, we uh, have the emission of uh, radiation, and uh, that yields a uh, photon. And if that photon is energetic enough, and the field is strong enough, we produce a pair, a plus and minus. Those particles will accelerate in the field context again, and they will radiate again, and so we get a kind of a, a double chain or avalanche process. And if the laser in the background is strong enough, it will drive the process. So we generate more and more photons and pairs. Um, up to a point where the conditions for uh, the process to sustain are no longer hold or no longer hold. Mm. Okay. Now um, in the uh, literature um, this you find a simple uh, example. Um, Scaling and so called rotating electric fields. A rotating electric field um, simplifies the situation in so far as there is only an electric field, no magnetic field, and the field um, has no dependence on space coordinates, so that uh, complication goes away. And then, um, as I already explained, the first thing we have to do is we have to um, find the momentum of the particles. So the field is here an external field, scale it, it doesn't change. No? The code has the complete feedback loop. So when there are particles uh, and, and the particles of current, then uh, that leads to secondary fields, they of course superimpose this laser field, and all over it is a self consistency problem. Um, here it's not. We have only an electric field that stays as it is, it doesn't change, it doesn't become stronger or weaker, it only rotates as a function of time. And then the, 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 the thing we have to do is we have to obtain momentum because the quantum efficiency parameters depend on momentum and field. The field is given, so we need only momentum. So we integrate uh, the, the simple equation of motion for those initial conditions. That's the solution. And then we plug those uh, momenta Px and Y into chi e um, and uh, plug also the field into chi e and make a few approximations and uh, so that's very straightforward um, and so uh, we essentially obtain an estimate for this uh, quantum efficiency parameter chi as a function of t and it scales as e squared times t squared over the Schwinger field then we can uh, resolve for T. And uh, if that parameter chi gets close to 1, then the cross sections will become big enough to generate uh, radiation um, or um, uh, generate radiation with, with, a, with a probability that's almost, that's, that's not almost uh, 1. And so, um, uh, 
of this estimate of one does this, and that's, that's this expression equal to one, and then uh, you can uh, obtain the time, after which it happens. So uh, that's uh, now an estimate of how long it will take for the laser to bring a particle into a situation, or into a condition, or into a state, from which on the escape process could start. Uh, this later on called the creation time. And um, now we want this creation time to be much smaller than the cycle time of the laser, you know, because um, that's, um, uh, we have made the approximation of constant and cost fields, so the, uh, let's say, any uh, process of air production or radiation emission has to happen instantaneously. And so that's what we want, and that leads then to an estimate uh, for the field amplitude, the naught of that rotating field, uh, for which the process might start. And here we see uh, that it has to be much bigger than this quantity here, and if you plug omega for the laser um, in and m uh, is the electron mass, you obtain that this node has to be much bigger than 10 to the minus 3 So you should as 10 to the 80 volt per meter, so that would then be 10 to the 50 volt per meter, and it has to be bigger than this. So I say, um, probably about 10 to the 26, so a few times 10 to the 26 is sufficient uh, to trigger the process in a rotating field. That means in a field that extends to infinity. You know, a field in which any generated particles can never escape. Now the computer tells me uh, the situation is really more complicated than this. And uh, so um, before I show you um, a few pictures, um, Here's uh, a, a paper by, by Alexander Pitotov from 2010, and he gives um, uh, some of the accurate um, uh, estimates uh, for uh, the uh, air production uh, as a function of time in that constant rotating field. And uh, his um, um, results are the following. The, uh, N is the uh, number of pairs produced um, as a function of time. So uh, this number grows exponentially with, with, a, uh, with a growth of gamma. And this uh, gamma depends on this time TEM, which is the time between two incidents, so the air production process, and then there's something happening, and then even another, and another, and another. <coughs> and, uh, the time between uh, consecutive processes that would approximately this TEM. And this uh, um, 1 over TEM depends on uh, this parameter mu. And this parameter mu is uh, the ratio of the electric field versus the south of Schwinger field times uh, L for as a spine structure. Constant. Here's an estimate for TEM. And uh, the first thing one would like to do is, of course, to benchmark this uh, result, uh, this analytical result for race for those very simplistic situations um, uh, against the code, the benchmark the code against this analytical result. Yeah, so both, both have some truths. You know, the model is, is suffering from extreme uh, simplifications, and the code has all sorts deficits. OK, so um, now um, in a, a more general context, when does cascading happen? Well, <laughs> cascading is, is, is a self-sustaining process, but it means the laser is the energy source and uh, the laser drives uh, the, the cascades up, so it makes uh, more and more particles. And uh, for this to happen, particles have to accelerate. And so it would typically uh, require that uh, KIE um, derived with respect to T has to be larger. So that means the particles become energy. And then uh, one would like to have a so-called creation time to be smaller than, than the time in between um, consecutive um, uh, events and also much smaller than the escape time, which is the time um, the particles would take to leave um, a region of five fields. Yeah? Um, this rotating um, uh, uh, spatial constant field is, is just a model. There is no such field in the, in the real world. Yeah? In the real world, we have tiny laser foci so the laser light is focused down to maybe micron or less. So this is uh, essentially a very small volume. And the particles will drop quickly um, get out of this focus. Um, 
And so um, it's natural that such an escape time shows up. Um, also, the field needs to sustain long enough to, to have consecutive events, otherwise the cascade can also start. And if it takes too long to bring the system into a situation where cascading can be triggered, uh, then the laser might be off, or the field might be gone, and so on, and this is lower on time scale. But this is only a very rough estimate. In reality, um, we uh, see that the uh, laser light is indeed um, able to trap charged particles. Now, as soon as they are born, they start to radiate because they radiate, they emit uh, strong um, high energy photons, and those photons take a lot of momentum and energy. Okay, so the electrons cannot escape, yeah? they get locked, yeah? and uh, they, they regenerate, they recirculate. Yeah? That's, uh, that's a very strong evidence of this impurity in the cold. Yeah? Because without this, it would not be possible to explain the huge numbers of the plus and minus we obtain from relatively tiny isospores. So here's now a simulation, a few pictures now. Um, <laughs> It's a very simple uh, situation. You can do on your pocket calculator, on a, or maybe also on your iPhone. Yeah, so this is not uh, a new simulation. Um, I have um, a photon pulse that has 50 MeV and uh, an energy spread of 1 MeV. So it's a very sharp um, energy, photon energy. It's a, a Gaussian pulse. The intensity um, is 10 to the 90 watts per square centimeter. It uh, propagates in the positive C direction and it starts, let's say, from the lower end of the simulation box, as you will see in a second. And then I have two um, laser pulses um, that also move along the photon pulse, along the C <coughs> axis, uh, head on. So one moves along the positive and another one moves along the negative direction. And, uh, so we have those two laser pulses plus the photon pulse, and then the, the photon pulse is immersed into one of the laser pulses. So it's uh, immersed into the one that goes in the positive C direction. So here's the situation. So uh, this is um, now the C axis is along here. And then we have the lateral axis, X and Y. Um, this up here is the scale. And this is a, an isocontour plot of the photons um, early on. Yeah. So this is all on femtosecond time scales now. Just I don't plot the time, uh, the, the precise time, because it doesn't really matter here. But uh, the whole the whole thing you now takes place in femtoseconds. So this is a few ten to the minus fifteen seconds. And uh, the, the, uh, this is a, a linear polarized laser pulse moving with the Gaussian envelope moving that way, and then there's a second one moving that way. And this is the second part, it's talking about moving that way. Now I'll try to move on. Is it working? Oh well, you see? Nothing is happening um, as long as the two parts do not hit each other. You see the, the photons uh, co propagate with the intense laser. And they do this essentially without triggering any action. So there's no cascading, no air production yet, almost no radiation production, nothing. Um, there is no uh, radiation production because we have no charged particles yet. And then, you know, the two parts hit each other. And now you can see that secondary photons are leaking. And in that plane here, which is the X plane, which is the plane of polarization of the laser pulses, they uh, escape spherically. Um, the other plane, uh, the Y plane, they don't. Yeah, and you, you can see this here, let's see it later. Okay, and here's um, the, um, the, the, the air production as a function of time. So this is in outer limits uh, down here that you see. Um, at, uh, the start of the simulation, there were only photons, you know, 600,000 in normalized numbers. And then as time progresses, the photon number first depletes a little bit. And then at about 100 uh, uh, time steps, the two laser pulses uh, meet each other. And then, you know, pair production um, uh, really sets in. And um, from the uh, pairs produced, secondary photon production sets in. And so the photon number goes up. 
and that their uh, production number goes up. It stops when we release as soon as the two parties have passed each other. Um, and the reason for this is that uh, as long as they hit each other, the quantum efficiencies become very high. And uh, when they uh, pass each other, they become very low again. And so there is a plateau on, for the particle number, for the plus and minus the particle number. Um, but since we now have more charged particles, and they are now immersed in the ingoing and the outgoing uh, laser pulses, so they trapped in the laser pulses, they radiate heat. See the radiation continues to go. Here's a situation with more energy. So I've uh, doubled the laser intensity. And I do the same thing. Take it again. Each other to the pulses. And I hope we get a much stronger photon signal. So you see it's better visible. This is now the electron production during the collision. You see. And here is the uh, radiation production. Okay. I can stop here or Okay, that's a good a good point. Okay. So five minutes. Yeah, five minutes. So what I see is they, trap, they get trapped in the laser field. 
particles. So the matter field is going in and out, and they take the particles along. And uh, here's uh, the onset, and then you can see um, those are particles that, that continue to accelerate as the laser goes out uh, in this direction, and the second one goes out in this direction. And so the particles um, take up energy. The scale here is 1000 MEC times 20 times 40. So that is uh, 20 GeV, 40 GeV, uh, approximately. And uh, so, uh, so that's, I guess, the final picture. So um, you don't see that a further part is out there. So the peak energy was about 15 TeV. You know? But that is a, is a very inter interesting acceleration concept. I mean, I have not tuned it yet. So there is obviously, you have a focusing laser particles as a separator or something. So the laser particles when you focus, it has a longitudinal field, of course. And it has also lateral fields. And at 10 to the 25 watts per square centimeter, there is a huge line pressure. And, and now, if you could get a particle in the separatrix of the laser parts, the laser would take it to know where you get a very good uh, acceleration mechanism. Only getting particles in is very complicated, but this is now like, like ionization seeding of wave fields. You could really immerse particles by uh, accurate um, air reduction into the depth separatrix, and then uh, I expect that I can concentrate more particles here at very high energies. But even now, they get very efficient acceleration and they get very high energies. So, uh, all you need is a 20, 10 to 25 watts per square centimeter laser parts, and then you don't need to make feel accelerated. <laughs> I don't know what's easier. Um, okay, oh, okay, there's one more. Uh, this is uh, positrons. Yeah, the positrons, uh, they co-propagate with electrons. So this is a quasi neutral beam. And here's now a um, different picture. Um, this is a different simulation. Here yeah, I have a very sharp um, uh, photon pulse. Yeah, the photon pulse is, uh, is, um, is uh, I mean, it's almost non-energetic. And it's also localized to a small region in space. I mean, there is, of course, an ambiguity. Is a, what type of focus is, the wider, of course, the energy spectrum of, of the pulse must become. Um, but nevertheless, it's a, a, a quite compact entity. And uh, then, uh, you know, um, I plot um, ISO contour surfaces of it, and then I have a color coding on top, and the color coding on top of the photon ISO contour surface is the uh, produced um, positron entity. So, uh, can see this. You see that it's color coming up. So, uh, so um, I can now I can see by this where um, the quantum efficiency is in, uh, in this uh, context the highest. And then uh, you know there's not much happening until the two laser parts meet each other, and that's about now. And then you can see. Probably uh, there's nothing Okay. So there's now um, um, secondary photons coming up. Um, there is a structure, and the color coding, you know, is the positron density blue is very low, and red is high positron density, and they they, uh, they oscillate against each other um, in, in the laser pulse, and uh, continue. Well, it's, uh, the better you see, high high positron concentrations, low positron concentrations. And that is the underlying photon signal, and that is the original seed here. So that's secondary, and that was the primary seed. And uh, as we continue, uh, let's see this quite nicely. Should be one more. Yeah, okay, now it breaks up in the middle, so they fly out. There's now there's a source in the center. And uh, here we have positrons. And here with positrons, they now pick up high energies flying out this way, flying out this way. Okay, <coughs> now that was my little uh, picture show. Um, the um, um, topic now is um, how do you do this on a computer? So, um, to summarize, um, we have um, a set of um, uh, transport equations uh, and um, uh, the um, I have now um, the problem um, to uh, find a solution for them. 
And since the data um, uh, fields um, involved, or the fields involved in this context are typically extremely high, uh, that uh, implies a large momentum of adopted. We have just been talking about um, TE energies, uh, and also probably large displacements. And so um, the question is uh, which kind of solver for those extended quantum solver <coughs> plus equations. Um, uh, in the first part of, of my lecture, uh, would you apply? Um, a direct flux of solver um, without adaptive uh, um, refinement technologies would not work because of the phase space inflation. You know, the, 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 the field is simply so huge that you cover too much phase space. And so um, the, uh, our choice was to use particle in cell. So particle in cell is a finite element method. And uh, I will come to this in a second. So, uh, what does the code do? Now, look, if you have a classic equation, you have an equation of the type df dt, where f is now a probability density function, uh, a function telling you how likely it is to find one of those particles <coughs> in a certain place. So, those isocontour dots that are showing, they have been obtained from, the, uh, uh, from, from this f, you know, from the, uh, typically from the uh, probability density, uh, by, by calculating real densities. And so uh, you have the FDT and you put the zero. And the solution of such an equation is, uh, is this here. So F at T is equal to F at zero. On the characteristics of the particle, that means on the trajectories. And if you go along the trajectory, that's how the distribution function behaves. So F of zero is directly mapped into F of T. Okay. Now um, you have to obtain X of T and P of T. And so that means that for, um, if we use quasi elements, I will come to this in a little bit more detail in a second, then uh, we have to solve almost ordinary differential equations. Uh, so this equation is 42. So they look like uh, equations of motion for point particles. That means you update those equations. So from x of 0 and p of 0, we obtain x of t and p of t. And so all we do is we replace this x of 0 by a representation given by x of t and p of t, and vice versa for p of zero. And so, um, since we have f at time zero, we now have f at any time. So that's essentially what happens. So here, you have a solution in integral form, here again. And those expressions, 43, they go in here. And that gives us our f, x, p, and t. Now, for a Maxwellian distribution function, I have a simple example here. So that is a Maxwellian, and I assume that the particles um, uh, escape freely, yeah, they are free streaming, so they have some initial energy, temperatures, so or certain energy in the system, and then they escape. Um, the solution would be this. Yeah, so f of x, p, and t is given by this, where the x0 and the p0 are so the equations of motion from the form. Yeah, this one, this one. And then that's the final representation of the distribution function of the function of time. Now this is not yet a, a quantity you can observe. So we need to determine uh, or calculate the balance or the density from this. And uh, I calculate the density here, and now you see the density behaves like this. And that's what you expect. Yeah. Or you have a, a gas, now let's say in a, in a combustion engine or somewhere, and heat it up temperature and then the thing explodes and that's uh, what the density would do. You see as time increases um, it becomes wider, the gas expands and also the density decreases. Yeah. As I can see here as a refactor it becomes smaller as time increases and the width is determined by this quantity down there and it decreases. And there's also a typical time scale involved you know, because of thermal velocity. So, so any gas expansion cannot go faster than time. Now, um, how do we do it in the code? And the code introduces, uh, as I already said, quasi elements, finite elements. And it makes the assumption that um, there is a, um, that the, the phase space can be separated into a configuration part and into a momentum part. And though there are finite elements for configuration space and for momentum space, and the total is the product of the two. And then we use n such elements, yeah? and uh, the larger n, 
the more accurate uh, representation of the distribution function possibly is. And uh, so we sum over n, and, uh, um, and that is uh, an approximation for f, in which, in a mathematical sense, um, I can leave open. I, I do not address the question of convergence. And um, now we make a first assumption. The function phi is a product of other functions s. So in this function phi uh, would work in three dimensional space. And so we have um, the ansatz that uh, it is a product of one dimensional functions along x, y, and c. And the same um, for the momentum uh, phi. Now, the functions S are given explicitly down here. So, one can choose which kind of elements to take. Um, there are constant functions. This is like a hat here. You know, this is a piecewise constant function. And now, this is a piecewise constant, but it's, uh, it goes up like this, it goes down like this. You can also use higher order form factors. There is a relation between the form factor and the noise level. Because the usage of such a form factor implicitly means that you implement a third function on the grid, uh, grid will be needed to solve the electromagnetic field. Okay, we'll come to this. And uh, yeah, then there's a normalization condition. So there's a cell volume, right? It's a finite element of the cell volume. Um, it is equal to this. So that is now a. Uh, is now a discrete um, uh, gap you know, in, in, in x, y, and z direction. So that's, the, that's about the, uh, the, later on the, the cell size. You know. And uh, here in momentum space, um, you have a similar dimension. OK, now we make one more assumption. To say the particles are sharp in momentum space, so they are delta functions in momentum space while they are still extended in configuration space. Now this finite element method um, is uh, the now, uh, this, this ansatz for the, for the distribution function and now we used to, um, uh, in, uh, for the equations of motion for the probability densities. Yeah, so you plug it into the equations of motion and the goal will be to get um, then uh, other equations of motion that, that, have, that look more like open differential equations for those coefficients x i of k and p i of k. Yeah. And so that means we've reformulated the problem solving a, a set of extended classic equations uh, in, in solving a, a coupled set of ordinary differential equations in one point. <coughs> okay, and now how do we derive the equations of motion? Yeah. So uh, here's uh, a classic equation. So then you see it's uh, simpler than equations uh, for cascading. There's no, no such term. And uh, the first thing to do is uh, we uh, integrate um, our momentum space. Yeah. So that's what I made up here. And then you see that the force term, the Lorentz force, disappears. So the only we made is this equation 57 on the other part. <laughs> and, uh, um, plugging in the distribution function leads to equation 59. So you see, there are now uh, the configuration space form factors, which we have to derive with respect to x, i, and x. And since there's a symmetry, so the form factor is symmetric, you can replace the derivative with respect to x, i by minus the derivative with respect to uh, x. That has been done here in equation 16, so you have to fulfill this kind of condition. Now, if you perform a space average, you know, so that means you multiply by x and integrate over the cell volume, uh, this equation can only be fulfilled if that condition holds. So, in the weak sense, this here is equivalent to that expansion property of the Flask equation. Yeah? So, you have finite elements, and uh, the finite elements they follow certain equations of motion, and uh, so you update them. And if you assemble everything together afterwards, you get a good representation of your distribution function. And that's the, the core idea uh, in the course. Of course, we would like to have uh, also, um, we'd like to know how particles accelerate um, uh, in, in that context. 
So we take uh, the next higher moment. That means we do not simply integrate over momentum, but we multiply by momentum and then integrate over momentum. So we build average momentum. And uh, it goes through the same procedure. Now the, um, the reason for doing this is that now the force term will not go away. So uh, we end up with equation 63 here by um, after plugging in the finite elements uh, for, for Fk. We have uh, this contribution here, but that one in the lead sense disappears already, and then we end up with this second part here. Okay. And here you see there's a, a pi dot, yeah, that's the acceleration of the ice particle, uh, and being somehow equivalent to this term here. Okay, yeah, but uh, here we have to take care. In order to uh, get rid of the first equation, we have to integrate our space now. The integration of the space is R not an average, so we do not multiply it, <coughs> but the integrator of the space only, this goes away. Because of the equation of motion also. And then uh, it leaves us with an integration of the space um, for the second part here. Yeah? And that ultimately leads to equation 65. So you see um, the acceleration of the quasi element is equivalent to this term here. That is an integration over the volume of, uh, of the quasi element. Um, form factor and the force. And this force here is um, the Lorentz force. And this Lorentz force in turn is determined by um, the mean field, you know, by E, B, e and uh, also by the velocity. So solving a flask equation on a computer does not mean anything else than solving such equations by e equal to 1 up to n. So very simple, really extremely simple. Mm. Okay, now uh, in order to uh, to, uh, to to get forward here, um, you see we have to we have to tell what this f of x and t is. Now, if f or e and b would would be given as continuous function in space and time. Uh, and it would be simple enough we could maybe perform that integration analytically. But um, on the computer, all we have is a grid. You know, we have only a countable number of grid points. And so the fields are given on grid points and not everywhere in between. And so that means that this function up here is not given as a continuous entity, but it's also only given on grid points. And so we have to continue it um, in, a, in, a, in an appropriate manner. And uh, that is done here. So we say that this uh, function up there is a constant within a certain volume, and this is called the cell volume, and it's zero in our with this approximation, we, have, we are then able to, to integrate uh, this equation here analytically. And uh, since the form factor splits into the product of one dimensional form factors, all we have to do is we have to carry out this integration first. It uh, leads to a function uh, that depends on x and y. Uh, and uh, those uh, uh, positions, uh, CJ, CJ, and then we do the integration over y and the last of these we do the integration over x. And in the course of the process, um, it's very slow response times. Okay. Uh, we then obtain a, a grid based um, formulation of the equations of motion. Yes, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, we just depicted how the integration in one would work. You see, this is this uh, function f restricted to a cell volume. This is xi is the position of the form factor. That is the explicit chain of the form factor. And that is the integration range, you know, let's say integration variance on the integral. So um, you can see how, how to split the integration into separate pieces uh, in order to recover uh, everything. Yeah, and uh, so uh, I can uh, to go through this a little bit more quickly, I guess. So this is um, 
So this year the first integration has been performed mm -hmm. and that led to those functions here. Yeah. Uh, and now um, the, uh, the integration of the y has to be performed and then finally the one over c. And each time we get such a factor depending on, uh, on y, fi minus y and ci minus c. So all over we have about 27 factors um, uh, for the determination of the force equation on the grid for the quasi um, The higher the order of the form factor is, of course, the more points are involved and uh, the more terms, uh, the, of course, get in. And here you can also see by, by analyzing those functions that uh, this equation motion implements also a filter function at the same time. So uh, not every mode you know, gets accelerated and transformed in the same fashion. Um, so I quickly go through this. Yeah, and the final end, we have this equation where that quantity here depends on time and on grid indices. Explicitly, it is something like this. Those functions E, JKL, and V, JKL, they uh, have to be determined. And then the uh, next question is how is Dutch equation solved? Uh, so, this is uh, the Lorentz force equation. And uh, that is done uh, by a leapfrog uh, method. Leapfrog because uh, uh, the integrator must be uh, very fast. The magnetic field must not generate work. And uh, we, need, uh, we do not, uh, we cannot afford to store previous momentum, so earlier time steps for the particles. Because uh, a large uh, computer simulation that typically runs in the 13 and the 14 elements. And so you do not want to store elements of previous times because it double the peripheral computation and uh, uh, I mean the memory requirements. So those are restrictions um, for the for the algorithms. There might be more accurate algorithms than uh, that you thought here, but um, uh, that is all over um, from the point of economy and resource um, efficiency, accuracy, and so on, a uh, good choice. There are, um, uh, to give a reference, this is Gertzel uh, and Langen, yeah. or uh, it's also in the book I quoted um, uh, initially. And uh, there are better solvers nowadays, they uh, are more accurate, and uh, at the same time as uh, good, good properties, and, like, they are very efficient and so on. And uh, there is a publication by Wai, Luke Wai, uh, he works in Berkeley, he's an accelerated physicist, simulations of uh, electron beams and accelerators. Uh, and, uh, but I do not show how the body integration scheme works. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so what one does is uh, one formally integrates the class equation from T up to T plus delta T and then approximates this uh, integral up to second order. So that's done here. So those equations are accurate up to second order. I will start in third order. And then uh, one introduces uh, new momenta P minus and P plus. They are essentially the original momenta shifted by those quantities here. So the uh, work done by the electric field, so to say, is taken out. And uh, then we obtain equations in uh, the uh, uh, y, uh, P minus and P plus. Those are the ones down here. And they uh, represent rotations. And uh, so that uh, is then uh, uh, easy to integrate. And yeah, um, the final outcome is uh, this here. So we have <coughs> the, uh, a set of momentum P minus, which we obtain from the previous time step by subtracting the electric field contributions. And then we have the matrix A, which is determined by those quantities. The torus in here are functions of the magnetic field. Uh, that may look a little bit complicated at the moment, but it's no, a no brainer. It's really a uh, simple algebra, uh, straightforward. And, uh, and with the help of that matrix A, you can update the momentum. So we obtain uh, from uh, 
radius momentum and the object momentum. Okay. Okay. And um, in the likewise fashion, we have to update uh, the position so that uh, uh, momentum update is one thing, but then we have to update the position as well. And that happens in uh, two consecutive steps. And that's first a half um, time step integration um, from uh, x t to x of t plus delta t cap. Then uh, the uh, electromagnetic fields are evaluated at that intermediate position. That's important for the order of accuracy and stability. And uh, momentum is then updated. And with the help of the new momentum, the second half integration step uh, for, for the position is done. Um, that would be this one. You see here, you have the updated velocities already. So prior to this one, as to the momentum update. And uh, yeah, and with this uh, step, uh, the, the cycle is complete. And here's a, a schematic uh, picture of how that works. So first we go from xin to xin plus one half. Then uh, with the help of those positions and the mean fields, um, we can update the momentum, so pin to pin plus one, and then with the uh, new momentum, we can finally update xi n plus one and up to xi n plus one. But that completes the cycle. So all you've got to do in the computer is you use the computer, you allocate memory, then you tell what your initial distribution function should look like, and then you sample it. That means you place randomly the quasi elements so such that you get a good approximation of that function using some measure. And then uh, you solve those equations of motions. And then afterwards you have a diagnostic. The diagnostic essentially means you calculate some sort of dynamic properties like pressure, density, electric fields, velocities, whatever. And that's it. Yeah. That's the whole business. And uh, now um, I have to extend this um, uh, methodology slightly to um, cover uh, uh, reduction and Emission. And um, the, uh, if you recall the equations of motion, relative densities, they had source terms which were able to change the number of quasi elements in the simulation. So, up to now, the assumption was that the quasi element number was constant, but now it's not anymore. So, the under is a little bit more general. Uh, not only can the positions x, y, and the moment of ki or pi change, now k would be the photon. Um, and by, by, by this, the distribution function will change, but, but also um, the, uh, the number of quasi elements can change. So the plasma can become more dense, let's say, at the same time by production of new particles. Now, we have to go into <coughs> equations of motion with uh, this more general concepts. And that gives, of course, because of the uh, time dependence of the particle number, additional tasks. And um, the uh, first equation, so the uh, mass balance, that means uh, what uh, previously was integration of the class equation of momentum space, um, looks uh, in the quasi element formulation now like this. So this is now, the, let's say, the First equation for electrons and positrons, where there are radiation source terms and their production source terms. And uh, it's integrated our all momentum. Yeah, and so we see the, the radiation part drops off, and there is no radiation part anymore, and only the air production part remains, it survives this uh, step. And now you can see there are two, uh, essentially two contributions uh, which you have to do simultaneously. It's very difficult on the computer, so we do this um, one after the other. So this is a fraction, so you have to move the particles from one place to the other, and at the same time, the event generator now appears. Now you see, there is a form factor times probability here integrated to our momentum. So you would have to generate events at the same time as the particles move. Yeah. That is doable but complicated on the computer. And, uh, so we say, we do it into consecutive steps. So we move the particles first into new locations, and then we look 
if a dimension rate tells us, yeah, okay, we do small particles or don't, and then if so, we would produce more particles. So the inaccuracy here is, uh, uh, it can be measured. Um, that scheme is only relatively accurate here at that point. But uh, we take it, uh, uh, we take the compromise. Now, um, here's how it works. Uh, in, in, Depiction. So the, the red and the blue dots are electrons and positrons, and the, and, the, and the black dots will be photons. And now the rate of change of the, of the red and the blue dots has two contributions. One is they can move around in the box from one place to the other. So in every phase space element which you could uh, define, uh, the, the probability will change according to the motion of the particles. But at the same time, there are also photons, yeah? and they at their location, they can generate uh, new particles. So here, new particles, and here, here new particles could pop up. And so for those space-based elements, yeah, there could be the popping up of new particles, but also the immersion of particles from outside by motion. And that's uh, essentially the content of that set of operations here. You see that's the uh, change of rate by motion, and here uh, by this one. Okay, um, as um, in, the, in, the, in the previous outline, we can simplify this a little bit further, and here I do a, 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 an integration of an integration space. So I multiply the equations by x and multiply the by the volume of the cell, let's say, for some final volume. And then uh, equations 93, 94, or around. So I now get explicitly again uh, the, this, uh, those, um, this, this equations for particle displacement, and I get also an equation for the uh, change of uh, electron and positive numbers as a function of time. And now this equation 93 here is the basis for the design of the dimension matrix. So you, this is essentially the, um, a probability which appears produced, and uh, so we, um, I, I will talk about this a little bit uh, later. So we use a Monte Carlo process to uh, trigger um, uh, pair production such that on average uh, it corresponds to the equations. Um, now we need also a momentum balance equation, where you see there are many more terms. Um, in the momentum balance equation, we, uh, we have a radiation reaction uh, and uh, we have acceleration. Okay, I will show you um, next transparency. So after a configuration space average, so that means the integration of configuration space, equations 96 and 97. So there is uh, the uh, momentum balance uh, up here, and there is the acceleration. Um, so that's the total momentum change you know, that, uh, that corresponds um, to that corresponds to air production. And that's the, 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 that's the equation of motion. So there is the external field again, and there's the radiation reaction part to it. Okay. So momentum can change by the production of particles, and it can change by the emission of photons and by the external field. Now, let's say if you wanted to calculate the light pressure uh, that a, 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 a high, a high, a high intensity laser you know, puts on the nanofoil or on the vacuum itself you know, when it hits the photon parts, then we have to take uh, air reduction as well as photons into account. So it's, uh, it's now both. That's actually a very interesting question. And uh, yeah, that brings me almost to the end. Um, here again, um, it implies um, event generators for radiation production. In the other case, it implies event generators for pair production. And uh, it implies the uh, solution of all the equations of motion. And so the motion part and the event generation part is split into two steps. And uh, here's how uh, a schematically sketch how the event generator would work. Now, uh, to be precise, um, the Nina uh, Yalkina is the first author, and the other way around. Uh, and uh, so, what we 
have to do? Well, first of all, you have to calculate the total probability. Let's say the total probability for radiation or for reproduction are uh, over a time interval delta t. So that means you multiply that by delta t. And um, you compare this number, the total probability for radiation and air radiation, times delta t with a random number. So this is a normalized probability. So that is uh, certainly a number smaller than two. And you compare it with a random number that's uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. And only if that value is smaller than that random number, you do another step. That means you now reduce your pairs, you dice them out. Otherwise, you don't. And that's important uh, for statistics. But, but in fact, then, yeah, I don't have more. And uh, so, um, if that first condition holds, we go to the second condition. The second condition now means determine from the analytical shape of the variation cross-section or the variation emission cross-section the energies, uh, the angle or whatever. So we do not use um, angle-dependent uh, cross-sections. Um, we use angle-integrated cross-sections because at the high energies uh, uh, we work uh, radiation emission is essentially in the forward direction and also air production is essentially in the forward direction. But it appears if I almost call in here the forward direction. And, uh, but that can be changed, it's easy. I mean, that's uh, no brainer. You know, it's maybe uh, uh, one, two hours work and then you have the differential cross section. So, however, the computation load becomes much, much more complicated, um, much, much higher. And the event generator, you would have to go into Markov chain. Now, um, here um, are, are, are rates, and uh, one last step. Um, so this, this all that was trivial up to now, um, but um, for real computations, I mean, not the toy models I've shown you here, they, they, they run on the laptop, but if you want to handle real systems, I mean, you are talking about hundreds of microns in each direction, uh, and uh, maybe multiple picoseconds of simulation time all over. Uh, it is not possible to do this without adaptive simulation technology. So uh, this is uh, um, the so-called multi-scale problem. First of all, you have huge simulation box. On the other hand, you have intrinsically extremely small scales. Like that is, for instance, the entire solution that should be um, something like this, and only without um, hair reduction. Uh, radiation uh, production uh, it would uh, typically scale like one over omega naught or like the plasma frequency. And the, the larger of the two would determine what delta T is. But now um, there is also the dimensions amplitude involved. And if that one goes in the range of, uh, of 500 or 1,000 or 10,000, that would decrease your time step uh, size by 10,000. Yeah. Okay, now we have hundreds and hundreds of microns to spend, so right is to propagate around hundreds of microns, and your time step increases by, by a factor of 10,000. Yeah. And then there are spatial scales, of course, um, associated with this. So C times delta T is the uh, corresponding spatial scale, so that probably also becomes very tough. And so you want to economize as much as you can, and uh, so you run adaptive uh, simulations. There are two ways to do this. Um, one is um, particle refinement. So um, as particle number grows and the process of cascading, so that's an exponential growth under certain conditions, uh, your computation below grows exponentially. And so it can be that uh, you know that the last uh, ten time steps of the simulation are the most important ones, and that kills the resources. And so uh, what you've got to do is um, you have to you have to merge particles. That has to be done in a be done in a clever way, you want to, of course, you want to, um, uh, you do not want to change the total mass in the system. I mean, uh, you have so so many electrons, they are represented by so and so many quasi elements, and now if you merge quasi elements, you still have the same number of electrons, you know, that doesn't change. So that's this mass conversion uh, during merging. Uh, there needs also to be momentum conservation during merging, so the previous number of quasi elements they have a certain momentum and momentum distribution and after merging you want the same momentum and approximately the same momentum distribution only the fluctuation should be a little bit higher and finally there's also energy conservation 
on top, if you merge original public examples into new ones, it has to be done in a way that there is no divergence, that you do not produce artificial, artificially new charge distributions on the grid. Yeah? Um, because each electric field on the grid yeah, that could, uh, could be seed for a new cascade. So that, uh, that makes the simulations then, then really tough. And then uh, on top, you want to have a, a, a adaptive um, uh, a computing and, and a configuration space as well. And so here you see a grid in, in our computer, so um, which runs on three, four different refinement levels. This is, um, is, a, is, a, is a radiation center, so it's oscillating charges to the center. And here's, um, here's a, a, a lens, an optical device. And uh, the problem with adaptive non-constant non grids is that um, whenever the resolution changes, so from here to here or here to there, um, always those directions, there is reflection. Yeah, so any, any electromagnetic signal that propagates over this grid that gets radically reflected at resolution boundaries. So uh, this is like um, um, like a lens or, or an optical optical glass that has different reflective indices. Yeah? And now we shine a laser through this. So of course the light will propagate this different dispersion uh, relations and that will lead to, to, to reflection and, uh, and that will become a very complicated uh, situation. Here, this is unphysical, but the grid should not show this. It does, however, show this, unless you do it in that fashion. So, mass design is over, that is reflection free at such a basis. And if we succeed in doing this, that will save us about two to three orders of magnitude or lower this particle refinement, and that means we can handle one order of magnitude more in each direction or in two directions and uh, one order of magnitude more in time or whatever. <laughs> Okay, I think this brings me to the end. Uh, here's one, one other thing that goes along uh, with this code. As, the, as that refinement process goes on, uh, you know, the computational load goes, changes as well. I mean, the computational load in here is a whole lot higher than out here. You know? Because you have many, many grid points in there, many, many particles in there, and maybe only a few out there. Because out there they are very big, the grid is very big. So you cover a large space with a little information. In there, you cover a large space with a lot of information. Okay? So it's very expensive to compute here. And it's very cheap to compute out there. And uh, as this uh, refinement process goes on, you know, by some refinement, uh, refinement criteria, that's essentially information, theoretical problem, you need strong predictors, uh, your load changes accordingly and uh, you run out of sync. So uh, this is uh, computations are done on, on distributed computing systems. So some part of your computer would slow down and that would stop the rest. And that's not really good. And so you have to have um, adaptive uh, load balancing. And for this, we subdivide the computation of the main in many, many different patches. And when there is refinement going on in the center, the patches will focus in the center as well. So they will dynamically swap into the center, and then they will distribute over many, many threads, so they will make use of all the hardware they have so that the even load is achieved again, and then computational uh, performance goes up to us. So with this, I come to the end. There are a couple of things I've noticed, not covered, uh, for instance, this uh, Maxwell equation, adaptive Maxwell equations, details of radiation reaction, the physics of this, uh, details of air reaction, I mean, here the problem is, um, are higher order processes important? I mean, we have just uh, had this uh, Ritus Rikishov um, constant cross field approximation, step processes, but you could also have the prime process in strong fields. And the question is, what are the analytical properties of this? And in particular, if you have extremely high fields, how will that um, scale? And uh, that is an open question. And uh, so, so I, I have not, not, I have not discovered this. We've recently obtained the results here, and it's maybe most important. Yeah, and then uh, there's this numerical scale problem uh, so that would also be a separate lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Uh, how, long is the uh, how long is the typical calculation? Uh, how many time it takes to 
Well, what, what you what you do is what you say is um, um, you, you you state a time to push a particle. So there is a time to push one particle. And so that might be um, one particle per thread. Yeah, so I mean, if you have a distributed platform, you know, with many cores, you need to just mm -hmm. find all this as well. And so uh, I mean, what the, the latest number was, we had about 216 billion particles per second. On 900 GPUs, and each GPU had uh, 512 threads or so. So uh, you can do the last. Yeah. Uh, almost 10 to the 12 divided by, by 900 times 512 uh, particles per second. And then the same for the grid. So um, you, you have um, so and so many for the maximum solve, so and so many grid based operations per second. And um, then there is some overhead. Yeah, I mean, the, the, now the code has to communicate you know, uh, with, with neighbors and so on, that management takes some time. And that, all over that determines you know, how performed the code is. And typically, I, I think you're in the, in the range of, uh, of, a, of a fraction of a microsecond per particle, so. mm -hmm. maybe hundreds of microseconds, so 10, 10 nanoseconds. Mm -hmm. okay. More questions? No, then let's help. Uh, thank you.